Hello guys, I am Dr. Sonali Jagadi, Senior Resident of Zangaini Department at SCV Medical College and Hospital, Katak, having secured an All India rank of 3546 in NEET PG 2021. So today I am back with a very important update in the uh, topic of hyperemesis gravidarum, that is the management which has been given by the RCOG. The RCOG has updated in the year 2024 the management guidelines with, in, uh, with respect to hyperemesis uh, and this is a very important topic. Uh, the green top guidelines are my source. So before I dive deep into the management of uh, HG per se, let's just quickly brush with its basics. As you all know, hyperemesis gravidarum is defined as intractable vomiting which is associated with more than 5% of uh, uh, weight loss. The weight loss should be pre-pregnancy uh, weight loss associated with dehydration and electrolyte imbalance or uh, need for uh, hospital admission. This is seen in the first trimester and should be less than uh, 16 weeks of gestation and other causes of excessive vomiting should be ruled out. This is very important to understand because nausea and vomiting which is commonly termed as morning sickness in pregnancy is absolutely physiological. So you need to know the definition uh, and the diagnostic criteria so that you can uh, uh, differentiate hyperemesis case from morning sickness. Next, uh, very importantly, you should know is the risk factors. Now, uh, always uh, remember the HCG is the root cause for causing uh, excessive vomiting. So, more the HCG, more will be the uh, uh, nausea vomiting or hyperemesis. So, conditions like mul multifetal gestation, that is twin pregnancies, uh, are at higher risk. It has been seen in the low socioeconomic status uh, uh, groups are more susceptible low BMI patients. Now why low BMI? Because they have inherently less estrogen in their body. So when they become pregnant, the sudden rise of estrogen causes more predisposition to uh, having nausea and vomiting. Next, uh, also remember that uh, molar pregnancy where there is a lot of uh, beta HCG should also be ruled out. Nulli parents are more uh, predisposed to hyperemesis and also remember that any fetal abnormalities like trisomies and triploides should also be ruled out. So now let's also understand a very very important scoring that is the puke scoring which has been modified. So the modified puke scoring or the modified puke score index is something which is very important. It uh, divides the uh, hyperemesis into mild, moderate and severe. So basically in this, uh, we have three questions which need to be uh, assessed. The first question is that in the last 24 hours, how many times did she feel nausea? So that is again given uh, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 point according to the number of uh, hours she felt. If she felt more than 6 hours, then she's given 5 points. If 4 to 6 hours, 4 points. 2 to 3 hours, 3 points. 1 hour or less, 2 points. If not at all, then 1 point. How many times did she vomit in the last 24 hours? That's the second question. Again, if more than seven times or five to six times, three to four times, one to two times, or did not vomit at all. According to that, you'll again give her a score. Uh, keeping the same uh, scores, we will uh, also ask about in the last 24 hours, how many times did she feel retching or dry heaves? So after calculating all the uh, total score, we are going to categorize them into mild, moderate and severe. Mild is when the score is less than or equal to 6. Moderate is when the score is uh, between 7 to 12. And severe is when the score is between 13 to 15. Also remember that uh, some of the basic investigations that you are supposed to do in any case of uh, uh, hyperemesis includes your complete blood count. Also look for the hematocrit as it increases with due to dehydration and hemoconcentration. Uh, serum electrolytes are very very important. Do check for the uh, urea creatinine. So when there is hyperchloremic metabolic alkalosis or acidosis, we need to check her serum calcium level also along with urea, electrolytes and phosphate. Uh, rare cases may be associated with hypercalcemia. Blood glucose monitoring is important, especially if she's a known case of diabetic to rule out diabetic ketoacidosis. 
Ultrasound is important to check for the viability, whether it is intrauterine and also to rule out multifetal gestation and molar pregnancy. Thyroid uh, testing is important because hyperemesis gravidarum can cause a transient uh, hyperthyroidism due to the suppression of TSH levels. So doing a TSH is important. Also you have to do the LFT to rule out any other surgical cause of hyperemesis. Amylase lipase should be done to exclude acute pancreatitis and ABG as I told to rule out any metabolic disturbances. Next, uh, we should know quickly about uh, what are the complications which can result from uh, hyperemesis. So first thing is uh, obviously the nutrition deficiency because when she is not tolerating to uh, solid or liquid food, then she will have nutritional deficiency. So thiamine, that is vitamin B1 deficiency can lead to Wernicke's encephalopathy. Now what is the triad of Wernicke's encephalopathy? It includes the ophthalmoplegia ataxia and confusion. So this is the classical triad of Wernicke's encephalopathy. And this has been a very common uh, MCQ as far as uh, meat PG or any other entrance is concerned that what is the triad of Wernicke's encephalopathy. Generally they give you a case based scenario in which she will have these um, symptoms of ophthalmopegia, ataxia, confusion and uh, this will point towards Wernicke's encephalopathy and you are asked as to which vitamin deficiency is there. So remember that this is your thiamine or vitamin B1 deficiency. This is also seen in hyperemesis. There can be esophageal injury due to multiple uh, retching episodes and it is given a very classical name called Mallory V tear. This happens in the esophagus. So Mallory V tear can occur. Uh, there can be even psychosocial effects and coagulopathy is very very important and for this reason thromboprophylaxis should be offered to patients who are admitted. It can also lead to acute kidney injury in severe cases of dehydration and electrolyte imbalances. Uh, in fetus, it can cause preterm birth and low birth weight. Now let's come to the management. As I told you, we have classified uh, it into mild, moderate, severe depending on the puke score. Uh, so they tell that if 3 to 12 puke score with no complications, you can manage it in the outdoor basis with lifestyle uh, changes and dietary changes. Uh, obviously, you have to advise her anti -emetics. If 13 or above with no complications, again you can do a daycare uh, management along with oral anti -emetics. If any puke score with complications or she is not able to tolerate uh, even oral antiemetics or despite taking oral antiemetics she is having persistent symptoms you have to admit her so uh, this comes to the point where where are you going to hospitalize a patient in case you are thinking it's hyperemesis gravidarum so that is when she is continuously having nausea vomiting inability to tolerate with oral antiemetics associated with ketonuria or weight loss despite taking oral antiemetics and if she, uh, she has persistent of, uh, persistence of symptoms in spite of giving a daycare management. So in these cases, you are supposed to admit the patient. Now let's come to the management, which is the most important thing that we are uh, focused on. Uh, of course, fluid will be the first, uh, first and the foremost thing that you have to manage in a case of uh, NG. So the choice of fluid will be uh, normal saline. Along with that, you can give her KCL depending on the serum potassium levels. You have to daily monitor the serum electrolytes. Remember that you are not uh, supposed to give her any dextrose containing fluid first because plain dextrose containing fluid can lead to uh, or can precipitate Wernicke's encephalopathy in a thiamine deficient patient. So if you are giving IV dextrose, you also have to give 100 mg of parenteral thymine along with it to prevent Wernicke's encephalopathy. So now let's come to the uh, pharmacological management in the, which is the update given by the RCOG in the year 2024. This has been taken from the Green Top guidelines. So the first line man, uh, drug which is uh, uh, 
which is advised is the pyridoxine plus doxylamine. Now this is given 10 mg PD and you can increase it max up to 4 times daily. This is promethazine. Promethazine can also be given 12.5 to 25 mg every 6 to 8 hourly orally, IM or IV. Other drugs are your D2 receptor antagonist that is your promethazine or prochlorperazine which can be given. Now D2 receptor blockade causes antiemesis and that's why it is used as antiemetic. So the dosage is 5 to 10 mg 6 hourly orally IM or IV 12 mg perectally. Obviously perectally we don't give it in uh, antenatal patients. This is just for a theoretical knowledge I'm telling. Next, coming to the second line drugs. So first in the second line is your ondansetron. Yes, 5-HT3 receptor antagonist, that is your serotonin antagonist, is your ondansetron, which is very uh, commonly used in our uh, medicine uh, patients. But when it comes to antenatal patients, we have to be very cautious. This is the second line drug, remember, and it is uh, safe. See, in various studies, the ondansetron has been very controversial regarding its safety because uh, they have shown that there is minimal risk of orofacial uh, cleft. But uh, RCOG guidelines have told that yes, ondansetron can be used in patients where there is uh, uh, there is persistence of symptoms in spite of using the first line agent. So, if the first line agent fails, then only you can add ondansetron, and it is safe. Other drug in the second line is your dopamine antagonist that is metaclopramide. Metaclopramide, why we avoid is because of the risk of extra pyramidal syndrome. The third line or the last resort will be the uh, corticosteroids, that is prednisolone. Uh, okay? So if all the first line and second line drugs don't work, we need to go to the third and the last resort that is steroids. So once we are using this, we will give it 100 mg twice daily, okay? And once the improvement occurs, once the clinical symptoms and improvement occurs, we are going to change it. And what we are going to change? We are going to change it to oral prednisolone. So prednisolone will be given in the form of oral. Oral prednisolone is given and this is given uh, as a dose of 40 to 50 mg. Daily, and then we are going to gradually taper it uh, until the lowest maintenance dose comes and then we can uh, stop it. So this is the first, second and the third line management of the pharmacological drugs that have been uh, given by the RCOG. Just to uh, show you the RCOG Green Top Guideline, now this is the page which uh, is the article from which uh, I have taken. Now here they have clearly mentioned first line uh, is for the antihistaminics, toxinamine, pyridoxine, okay, and they have given the strength, okay. In the, the second line again, uh, ondansetron, it should not be used as the first line, that's very important because uh, very small risk of orofacial clefting, as I told, metaclopramide because of the uh, extrapyramidal effects, okay. And this is the article which you can go through, uh, it's given in the green top guideline. Then again they have uh, mentioned about uh, what are the adverse effects, how you can prevent it by giving thiamine supplementation, okay, when you are giving a dextrose containing IV fluids. Okay. Again they have told that uh, when do you discharge once she is uh, able to tolerate uh, oral anti-emetic or she is able to control, uh, accept oral diet to get a discharge. Also remember very important point is about the venous uh, thromboembolism uh, risk because of the excessive dehydration there is a risk of thromboembolism and that's why thromboprophylaxis should be offered to inpatient uh, patients who are admitted this is also important and this is also recommended uh, you can give IV heparin uh, so this is important to understand so low molecular weight heparin should be offered unless there is any specific contraindication uh, also 
remember that there is some other complementary therapies which are uh, prescribed or is given as a placebo like food like ginger or any acupuncture, acupressure. These all should be taken only after due consultation with the gynecologist. So with this, I have completed the recent update on hyperemesis gravidarum given by the RCOG guideline. This is extremely important for the AIMS, NEET PG, as well as the postgraduates who are giving their exam. This is a recent update, so it is important that you know each and every update that I have mentioned regarding the management and the drugs used along with the dosage. Thank you and have a great day. If you have any doubt, feel free to write in the comment section or you can DM me in my telegram handle. Bye-bye.